Drilling crews, blasting crews, site prep mobile equipment operators, dragline operators, dredge operators, and miners and contractors all must operate safely in the wet mining regions of Florida. Whether you're mining aggregates, sand, phosphate, or other materials, the geology and karst topography of Florida creates site-specific potential hazards. Today in this training video, we're going to examine methods such as the examination of surveys and coring data to determine where to safely drill and blast for materials, site prep procedures for dragline placement, proper dragline location in relation to faces or high walls, berm construction on travelways adjacent to water, correct positioning of dredges in proximity to faces and high walls, and a variety of other safe work practices to help you work safely in the wet mining areas of Florida. Hello and welcome to another in our exciting mine safety training video series. Today we're going to be talking about safety in wet mining. A good place to start our video is to more closely examine the karst topography and limestone geology of Florida. Underground water and sinkholes create seen as well as unseen hazards in the wet mining areas of our state. What creates sinkholes in the state? And why are they such a danger to the mining industry operations? In many areas of Florida, calcium carbonate limestone is prevalent. When fluctuating underground water with carbonic acid dissolves that limestone, then an underground karst topography, or a big collection of underground caves, channels, and a rough bumpy topography are formed. When enough of the limestone is eroded forming these caves or channels, then an underground depression susceptible to collapse or a sinkhole is formed. Sinkholes can be from a few feet deep to over 300 feet deep. Sinkholes are a serious threat to your safety and upon collapse can kill you. In mining, sophisticated scientific, engineering, core data, and drilling logs must be used to help locate and identify underground karst topography with sinkholes, voids, and other dangers. First, as a drilling company, you've been through a site-specific hazard training session with a mine owner-operator. Are you familiar with the mine and your task area? Do you need to be escorted by a superintendent to the drilling area if it's a new location or you See need guidance. Sta Do you have a site-specific standard operating plan in place, spelling out safe work practices and procedures for your employees at this mine? Ensure that you're going to be drilling in the buffer blast area that is located behind the drag line or mobile equipment dig lines. Request that a mine operator supply you with a core drilling record for the area that you're to drill in. Does that core record indicate any type of rock strata, channels, or caverns in the area and where they are in relation to where you'll be drilling? Be aware of these potential danger zones. The mine operator will have marked locations for new holes to be drilled for new shot points. In many cases, those locations may be behind a high wall in a buffer area adjacent to water. Prior to moving the drilling rig into place, perform a visual inspection of the drilling area. Remain in the buffer area for inspection and later during drilling. Be careful not to walk between hole locations and out to the high wall or the face of the mine. Do you see any unusual cracks, seams, or depressions at the surface that could pose a danger to you and or the drilling rig? 
based on the core record and workplace examination, if there are no areas of concern for the physical safety, then move the drilling rig into position and drill the new blast holes. As you drill, if you see the drill bit drop, if you see the rate of drilling speed up, if you observe any major drilling deviation, note it on the whole diagram chart and drilling record as a void. Make certain to report any of these events to the mine operator and blasting crew. You must warn them of potential underground rock conditions that could lead to collapse or sinkholes. If at any time during drilling you feel that conditions are unsafe, stop your activity, contact your supervisor and mine operator, and seek help immediately. When the blasting crew is ready to move on location to place ammonia nitrate or emulsified ammonia nitrate in the blasting holes, make a visual inspection of the blasting area. Again, do you see any unusual cracks, seams, or depressions in the area? If not, then take the whole diagram chart and the drilling log and review them for deviation in the rates of drilling. It might indicate underground rock or strata conditions that could lead to collapse or sinkholes or voids. If there are no deviations indicating possible underground caverns, caves, channels, or sinkholes, then proceed to fill all of the blast holes with ammonia nitrate, caps, and boosters. Again, at no time should you walk between the blast holes and out to the high wall or the face of the mine. Upon completion of the filling of the holes, and when appropriate, conduct a normal mine pre-blast clearance of all persons from the area. Perform the blast. And after the all clear, make the post-blast visual inspection. If there are any abnormal cracks, seams, or depressions, report them to the mine operator at once. If not, then clear your team out of the area so that the next phase of mine work can begin. We've covered safe work practices during the drilling and blasting work areas. Now let's turn our attention to site preparation, dragline operation, and transportation of materials in wet mining. Site prep for the drag line is the next work task at hand. A visual site inspection has got to be performed. If there are no abnormal cracks or seams, then an area approximately 150 feet by 150 feet minimum in size must be constructed for the drag line pad. A minimum buffer or distance of 30 to 50 feet from the high wall must be maintained while the pad is being built and the site prepared. Mobile equipment operators must take shot rock or materials that are generated from the blast and fill the occurring cracks or seams from the blast. The filling of the cracks and then the completing of the earth is performed to deliver a level pad with a smooth surface for the drag line to operate on. Mobile equipment operators must be constantly on the lookout for other vehicles in the area or miners on foot. And again, whether operating mobile equipment, driving a vehicle, or on foot, no worker should walk or drive a vehicle between the blast area and the high wall or the face that is being mined. A visual inspection must be made of the pad area to ensure that the cracks have been properly filled and that there are no surface abnormalities. Once a satisfactory inspection is done, the drag line may move into position. When moving a drag line to the pad area, there should be a minimum distance or buffer between where the drag line operates and where new drilling and blasting are to occur. Many mine operators establish a minimum of 1,200 to 1,500 feet, or about a quarter of a mile in separation between the drag line pad and the drilling and the blasting. You don't want any future blasting to damage or to create additional fractures in the drag line pad area. To prevent the drag line from going over the high wall, the drag line operator should establish the minimum distance during operation that the drag line must be from the face of the high wall. 
Different drag lines will have different bucket reaches with the bucket and cables. That reach could be from 100 feet to 250 feet depending on the size of the drag line. The drag line operator must identify a dig line and when pulling the bucket to the drag line, make certain to lift the bucket before it gets too close to the high wall and drag line. Lifting the bucket at this correct point will prevent the operator from undermining the high wall and low wall and prevent the drag line from going over the face and the high wall. After the drag line is built material stockpiles, then front end loaders will be loading materials from the stockpiles and taking those materials to a crusher and conveyor belts. While driving from the stockpile to the crusher, make certain that you follow the proper traffic patterns and only drive on designated travel ways. Don't drive off onto unapproved travel ways or across open land that might have caverns, channels, seams, and even sinkholes. Also, observe all travelway berms. They should be built to the mid-axle height of the largest piece of mobile equipment or vehicle using that travelway. Do you see any berms that either have gaps in them or that need to be reinforced with material? If you do, report these berm dangers to your supervisor at once. Finally, drive the posted speed limit and if you have to slow your speed for safety, then adjust your speed for existing conditions. In wet mining, dredges float on the water and they operate to mine sand and other materials and then pump those materials to processing plants. Put on your Coast Guard approved Type 3 personal flotation device on the shoreline prior to getting into the transport boat going to the dredge while working on the dredge and then on the boat or the craft that transports you from the dredge back to the shoreline. Again, remember you should always wear your PFD in required locations and on the dredge. The dredge operator must keep the dredge a safe distance from the high wall and face that the dredge is cutting or suctioning from. A good rule of thumb is to be about 250 feet from the bow of the dredge to the face. The tail line cable and the side cables must help position the dredge in this safe zone during operation. This distance must be maintained to keep the high wall from collapsing onto the dredge and damaging it or sinking the dredge. The dredge winches and cables must be properly maintained at all times to allow the operator to position and to maneuver the dredge. If the winches must be inspected or repaired, always lock out, tag out, and dry out power to the winches before performing these tasks. We've reviewed the various tasks in wet mining in Florida's karst topography and limestone geology. If you're surveying, taking core samples, drilling, blasting, operating a drag line or a dredge, always be cautious and never, I repeat never, take ground conditions for granted. Until our next exciting mine safety training video, work safe. Hey Bubba, pay attention. This is not over. You want to get it on, do you? As we give credit to those miners who helped us make this video today, we'd like to leave you with this one thought about PPE. Always get it on. During the making of this video, the operators of various mines have allowed the staging or the recreation of certain conditions which may at first appear to be unsafe and not according to certain federal, state, and or company safety procedures. These scenes were created strictly to demonstrate the differences between correct and incorrect safety and work procedures in the mining environment. 
At times, incorrect procedures may have been intentionally left in the video sequences to allow mine safety instructors to ask, what's wrong with this picture? The conditions in stage scenes are in no way a true reflection of the condition or the operation of the mine shown in this video production. Finally, this video must be augmented by new MSHA rules and regulations that may be implemented at any time in addition to changes in your company's safety rules and regulations that may be put into practice. This video training program does not purport to cover all federal, state, and or your company's safety rules and regulations on the topics covered. For answers to any questions that you may have, consult with your supervisor or your company's safety manager at once.